express my gratitude <laughs> to the, for your welcome, for the Bikinis to come today and to be here. It's very touching for me uh, to, to see that uh, real interest from the Bhikkhu Sangha for the Bikini. Um, it's not always been my experience, so it's, it's very beautiful to see that. And um, although I, I just explained, although I come from I come from California, you can hear I'm not an American. So I originally come from Wales, and um, I heard the Dharma uh, in my teens in Wales, and uh, felt an immediate deep uh, confidence in the Buddha's teaching that the Buddha knows the way out of suffering. I felt a very immediate uh, confidence in the, the Buddha's um, insight and, and clarity. And then I lived in Amaravati Monastery from 1992 until 2009. Um, so I was part of the community there for many years. And then moved to America. And uh, we actually moved to a small group of nuns we moved there to start a branch monastery, that was the intention actually. But very soon after getting there, we realized, you know, if we're going to do this, we need, we need bhikkhuni ordination, we need to have the authentic ordination given by the Buddha, and that there were other women there in the area who, who were sort of um, uh, blazing that trail. So we felt it was very important to also follow, you know, to, to support that. So um, six months after moving to America, we left the Ajahn Chah lineage we were part of and took the Bhikkhuni ordination later that year, 2011. And uh, so we're now part of the re-emergence of the Bhikkhuni Sangha. And I have to say, without the support of the Sri Lankan Bhikkhus, it would be impossible. It's somehow the Sri Lankan Bhikkhus have real foresight and, and great compassion which I don't see in other, other um, uh, because from other countries much, very, very much, not very often. So it's thanks to the Sri Lankan Bhikkhu Sangha who have vision, you know, and, uh, and recognize that this is an important part of the Sangha being established in the West, and uh, it's also flourishing to some degree in Sri Lanka. Um, so I just very, very grateful that uh, that support is, is uh, in the world and here, right here in this temple. So, uh, sitting, I don't uh, prepare talks, so I was just sitting and uh, just contemplating. I've been traveling the last uh, couple of weeks in the UK and coming from America and there's been a lot going on, you know. In America we have the President Trump, which is very challenging. <laughs> And uh, in Britain, we just had an election last night, and uh, probably most people, regardless of which side you lean to, are not too happy with the results. So, you know, so uh, just uh, reflecting on uh, the world is uh, that the, that we're always trying to find a place of security and safety and. Um, goodness in the world, and it's difficult to find for more than a few moments. You know, there's always uh, wars and uh, strife and poverty and um, greed and all of these things, they're, they're just they're part of the turning of the world. And um, you know, I think in, in all of us there's this wish to find a place of, of purity and of truth and of integrity. And uh, you know, always looking for something out there that will provide that. And um, you know, on a on a world scale, it seems it's pretty elusive. It's hard to find. Um, you know, greed has a, a strong momentum. Hatred has a deep roots, and uh, delusion is rife in the world. So you know, so we're looking for clarity and purity in, in something that is already sort of motivated by confusion. And, uh, and then I was reflecting on, on being here in this temple. It's my first time here. And I uh, feel like, oh, this is like a little, uh, maybe not so little, like a point of light in the world. You know? It's like the world is, there's so much craziness going on, and then there's this point of light here. And then I was reflecting, well, what is it that makes, makes it bad? 
Is, is it the buildings? No, it's not the buildings. The only thing can go on in these buildings. Um, is it the decorations? Or maybe they lift the heart. They're kind of beautiful, but it's not that. And uh, so it's the it's actually the people who live here, the people who live here, and the intention that that they hold of uh, integrity and uh, uh, the the intention to study the Dhamma and to live the Dhamma for the benefit of beings, and that's what brings the light into the world. And uh, so you know, I think many of you probably come here quite often, I don't know, it's my first time here, but maybe this is your regular temple, and, and this place is like a refuge, you know, you go to work and you have the, the news and everything that's going on, and you can come here and have some peace, and hear some truth. And maybe have a little quiet, or or have the joy of, of bringing a meal or giving. And so this place becomes a refuge, and that's really really important. That to have these places in the world is so 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 important. I feel it more than ever. It's so important that there are actual places that, that people can, can dig into and be reminded of their of their own goodness and truth and then give to that and, and take something good away from that in their hearts. But uh, it's also really important that we have that within us, that you know, when we leave the temple, that that's still there with us. So uh, if we don't have that, then we, you know, we're, we're, we're always reliant on something, again, outside of ourselves to bring that sense of peace and well-being. So this can help us, but it, it needs to be, it helps us to find what is already here in our own hearts. And the Buddha was so clearly pointing to the, you know, the truth is to be experienced, to be understood directly by, by each, each one of us. It's not uh, that we just you know, pray to the Buddha and look to the Buddha, but the Buddha is pointing us back to ourselves, to this, what's going on right here in this body and mind. <coughs> And uh, I feel a very important practice at this time, uh, always, it's time this practice, but especially this time, is the, the four Brahma Vihara, the practice of metta, of uh, benevolence, of uh, allowing benevolence to radiate in all directions from this heart center. And uh, not to be put off by the things that are wrong. You know, sometimes we think, oh, we can't have metta because we're too angry or we're too. Um, our heart's too small, or we're too frightened. But if we can just drop down from our thinking in the stories in our mind down into the heart, and just imagine like a light there, like a little sun radiating, and just let it radiate. It doesn't have to go, you know, as far as the, the far, furthest star, it can just be glowing a little bit here. Then maybe it glows a little bit wider and it touches the people around you. So I was practicing this on my way. I was on a long journey today to come here. And just practicing that in the, in the train, in the tube. Just let, just drop down. Let the heart radiate and let it be a source of warmth, you know, and kindness to whoever's around me. Regardless, it doesn't matter who they are. So this is something we can do. And it, uh, it starts to turn around the habits of, a, of the mind, of the selfing. And we create this, this story of ourself, who we are, what we can do, what we can't do. Who, you know, and then stories about the people who are close to us, and who we get entangled in negative stories or, or um, fantasies. You know, and then this brings us back to what's going on here. And we bring something good into the right <coughs> Here and now, blessing. Right here and now. So this is a, a practice that we can do that, that that turns the world around. It turns our inner world around, and it also influences those around us. We don't have to wait for somebody else to do it for us. We, we start right here. And like I say, you know, there's nothing. There's nothing that can really be in the way. So that light can shine on our fear can shine on our anger, can shine on our sense of smallness or frustration or confusion. Just, just, it just shines on through. Just like the sun at midday shines on all things equally. So 
So the practice of metta, karuna, so and the anukampa is another word for compassion. Karuna is another word for compassion. There are so many opportunities for compassion to arise. But instead of getting angry, to have compassion. So you have compassion for people who are who are harmed and people who are harming. So those who intentionally harm others, you know, they're creating very heavy karma for themselves. They will they will reap that one day, sooner or later. So having compassion for the blindness of that, rather than anger, resentment. And just seeing, you know, where anger and resentment arises, or where a smallness of heart arises, and then bringing up that quality of compassion. And, as we, as, and the more we know the, the suffering in our own lives, the more we can open to and acknowledge the, the dukkha or the suffering in our own lives, the more naturally compassion arises for others, because there's a resonance, we know what it feels like. It's not, uh, we're not aloof. So uh, developing compassion is so, so, so needed in the world at this time. And uh, a beautiful balance to that is uh, mudita, to uh, have a sense of joy and rejoice in the goodness that is also here. So I uh, was just staying with my father in the last few days. He's, uh, he, he's very uh, anti-religion <coughs> and, uh, and uh, traditionally British in his love of complaining. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he would say, tell a little story that he'd say, there are so many bad people in the world, and then I say, yes, it's true, and there are so many good people in the world too, you know. So, and that's mudita, it's like, there are many bad people in the world, and there are many good people. They don't, they don't get that in the news, but there are so many beautiful acts of kindness happening. There are so many acts of generosity, there are so many um, people who go out of their way quietly often to do good for others. And so to have mudita, and also to have mudita for nature. I feel that's also very important to rejoice in the beauty of nature. Because when we rejoice in the beauty of nature, we want to, we want to protect nature, we want to take care of it. When we see it as a commodity, then we just use it for our own ends. But uh, nature was not meant for that. We are part of nature. It's a, it's, it's a relationship of giving and receiving. So to have mudita for the, for the trees, for the birds and animals, for the earth itself, for clean rivers, to have mudita. And uh, for each other, you know, when we feel jealousy arising, when we feel the heart getting small again, jealousy, just recognizing, well, you know, that's painful for me, doesn't do the other person any good or harm either. And, you know, I could be benefiting. You know, it's, I always feel mudita, it's like you get, you get a, somebody else wins the award and you get the joy. I mean, it's great. You just benefit. So uh, cultivating that quality is an expansion of the heart. And upeka, uh, equipoise or equanimity. This is a very important quality as we, as we navigate through our lives in this world because we get thrown around a lot and there's a lot of wanting and not wanting. There's a lot of uh, elation and disappointment happens during a lifetime. And uh, somehow, I don't know how we manage to do it, but somehow also we, we live as though we're going to live forever. We forget that, no, this life is finite. Everyone, everyone who is born moves towards death. Whether it's soon or whether it's in many, many years, this is just, it's just the nature of things. It's, it's always, it's always there in the, in the, in the future. And this is not a, a miserable contemplation. It's not something to live in fear because, oh my goodness, one day I'm going to die. But it's just a, a truth. And the more we're attuned to that truth, the more peace 
we experience and enjoy. So uh, I started a couple of years ago, I started a practice of um, just with the breath, having the contemplation, this could be my last breath. I was amazed at the, the result. It's like my mind immediately went into presence and joy started to arise. Not because I want, <coughs> I want to die, but because suddenly this is this precious life. It's here, it's this. And there's this sense of, well, if I'm going to die, you know, if this is my last breath, do I want to be half conscious? Do I want to be nodding, you know, in my meditation? Do I want to be grumbling about something or daydreaming? No, I want to be here. I want to be present. I want to be awake. So, uh, Upeka is, is bringing in the big picture. It's bringing in the, the, the reality of what is born must die. It's bringing in the reality of, uh, also, it can, you can, sometimes I like to just contemplate in terms of, of space. So uh, I remember once, a long time ago, before I was a nun, go, uh, walking back uh, from, I'd been working all day in a, in a job that didn't pay an awful lot of money, and uh, I was, I had to go train home, and then I'd have to walk up a very steep hill, about a mile and a half, before I got home. And I was coming back in the dark, and, and I was feeling really kind of annoyed and grumpy and irritable and complaining away in my mind, and, me and for me, and, and, and then I looked up at the sky, it was night time, and I saw the, the night sky and the beautiful stars, and it just suddenly, it was like, how could I even take this little thing so seriously, you know? It's just a little moment in time in this vast expanse. And look, you know, it's, it's amazing. There's this huge cosmos. And, and on, in that cosmos, there's this planet Earth. And on this planet Earth, there's a little UK. And in the UK, there's this tiny little, you know, spot where I'm walking. It's so insignificant. And in that, again, there's this joy. So when we take ourselves too seriously, it all gets a bit heavy. But when we see things in perspective, it's like, ah, oh, I can let go. So upeka is a very important uh, quality to cultivate, because uh, if we don't have that, then we're always pulled around, pushed around by the changes of life. We're sorry when we get older, or when, you know, we're heartbroken when somebody dies. And of course we, you know, we are, and, but then we, we are and then we know this is the nature of things. So uh, I feel that the, the Western world now is very, very oriented towards the intellect and, and the mind. And uh, it's good, and it's good, it's great to have a, a good intellect and to have a bright mind. But uh, I feel that to really take care of the heart is, is vital. It's a little out of balance, I feel. And um, seeing how you know, with phones, you know, the iPhones and all that. So the whole world is there you know, on your phone. And people just lose themselves in that phone. It's, it's very much mind, visual and mind oriented. It's just, so you can just kind of live in that world of the mind. So it's important to take care of the mind, and, but also of the, of the heart. So, um, and sometimes we, we're so much in the mind that we don't kind of know where the heart is or what it's doing. So just to be aware, and I just started the meditation with being aware of the body sitting. So I find this a very, very helpful practice, you know, if, it, if we're not quite sure, if we're just caught in, in thoughts and, and ideas and stories, to just drop down into, what, what does it feel like to sit here? It's not an intellectual experience, it's, it's, a, it's a kinesthetic experience. It's immediate. There's no concept around it. It's just, it's like this. It feels like this. The body feels like this. And then maybe there's, I like it or I don't like it. Or it hurts or it feels nice or whatever. That's, that's extra. And we can know that. But uh, coming back to the body, it, it brings us out of the thinking mind into, which can be, uh, you know, it can wander into all kinds of different time zones and different places. It, it brings us back here. The 
Bonnie always brings us back here. So, uh, and the Buddha spoke about the everything we need for awakening, for enlightenment, is right here in this fathom long body. It seems hard to believe, doesn't it? No, no, it's got to be, it's got to be more than that. And, and we're fortunate that we have all the, all the scriptures, you know, written in, in many, many languages. So we can go to the scriptures and we can study and we can investigate and we can discuss. And that helps us to understand more deeply what the Buddha is pointing to. And, but what I find is the more I uh, explore and the more I study and the more I speak with people who have uh, good academic knowledge and good practice, the more I realize, oh, it really is very, very simple. The practice really is very, very simple. It's, uh, it's apparent here and now. It's this. It's here. It's, the, it's, it's knowing the changing nature of this experience. It's seeing the wanting and not wanting that arises in relation to this experience that is happening now, at any, at any now that we might choose. And seeing that uh, you know, the, the problems of our lives arise through the identification with this body-mind process that's, that's constantly changing. So we can't uh, stop it changing, and we can't make it perfect the way we want. But we can know it. We can know it and we can guide it in a direction of wholesomeness. We can guide our mind and heart in a direction of wholesomeness. And through seeing the, the changing nature of things, which we, know, which, which we see when we turn back and look here, and when we look outside, by, by directly experiencing those cha the changing nature of things, of a, of, a, of a feeling, or of a mood, or of a thought, or of a, a relationship. By directly experiencing the, the changing nature of these things, the Dharma is right there. By, by noticing the aging of the body, I've been fortunate enough to spend most of my life in a monastery, and, and you know, we don't have to try and look young in monastery. <laughs> you can just be interested in the, the, the process of uh, the body changing, aging, pains coming and going, pleasures coming and going, neutral feeling. You know, you can, you can take interest in that. It's, 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 a, it's precious, actually. So, by turning towards that very, very simple experience of body and mind, the, the whole of the teaching reveals itself. And, uh, you know, if we find it too difficult to notice the, those bigger things of, you know, like the body changing and so on, or we don't really want to acknowledge it, just being with the breath. You know, the, the breath to me is the most remarkable teacher, because Without the breath, we, we live, you know, maybe a minute, two minutes, three minutes. I think a few people can manage like five, five and a half, maybe, if they've been training. Very, very short. And yet, what is it? What is the breath? Have you ever noticed it? Have you ever really paid attention to it? It's fascinating. It's nothing. There's nothing. You can't pin it down and say, this is the breath. It, by its nature, it is a process of entering and leaving the body. It's constantly changing, constantly changing. And we breathe in, and the oxygen becomes nourishment for our blood, and uh, gives, us, gives us life energy. And we breathe out, and we breathe out, and we discard <coughs> the carbon dioxide. And while we're doing that, plants, I'm not sure they're in the room here, plants are doing the opposite during the day. So plants are breathing in the carbon dioxide that we're breathing out. The trees, they are breathing in the carbon dioxide that we're breathing out. That's nourishment for them. And they're breathing out oxygen. So there's this exchange going on all the time, constantly. 
And then even as we sit here together, we're all breathing together. We're all sharing. It's not like this is my breath, it's here. It goes, I've got my own little compartment of my breath. You know, it's, it's all being shared. So if I stop breathing for five minutes, I, I'll be dead. End of my life. And, but yet, while I'm breathing, is it my breath? Where, where does it start? Where does it become mine? Is it, is it as it enters my nostrils? Or is it, well, is it my lungs? Or what is it? It's very interesting. And then you breathe out, it's like, and maybe if, if you feel like, oh, I've been eating something, you know, I've got bad breath, or for a little while it's your breath, you're still feeling kind of attached to it as an identity as my breath. And then after a while it's just, it's out there. It's shared. So the breath is a very, very interesting teacher. And it's, it's always here with us every moment of our lives. So I'd just like to encourage you to, uh, to you know, develop your hearts and to take a real interest in this wonderful teacher that's right here every moment that we take for granted all the time. So I'd like to offer that tonight. <coughs>